one. Welcome to another Founder Wisdom Podcast slash CEO Wisdom. We have both with us today, Ruth Farmer. She is founder and CEO at Last Mile Education Fund. Have a bunch of interesting uh, experience, notably uh, working with uh, Obama and uh, a bunch of other experiences which we're going to talk about today. This podcast is brought to you by podfire.com. If you want to start scale, be invited to podcasts like this one find sponsors, or even be invited to a top 10 podcast. I can help you do that. I help people monetize uh, podcasts. If that can be helpful, podbuyer.com. Ruth, welcome to the pod. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself, your background, and Last Mile Education Fund? Sure. So I'm a bit of a uh, talent entrepreneur. I've been working for about 22 years on different ways to increase the talent pool in tech and engineering particularly related to women in underrepresented groups. And um, Last Mile Education Fund is um, the latest of many, many ventures. Um, but the first thing I've actually started independent of any other organization, I have been an intrapreneur many times building things within organizations like the Girl Scouts or the National Center for Women in IT or the Department of Defense. And today I'm actually um, building something separate only because it absolutely was a gap that nobody was filling. I don't think anything should be founded that's being done well by somebody else. And um, really it was a gap in the system. So we're basically closing the graduation gap among striving students from financially challenging backgrounds who are in high demand fields like computer science or engineering, data science, cybersecurity, because we have a massive workforce shortage in that space, but at least in the US, the bulk of students who come from lower income backgrounds don't finish college within even six or eight years. So it seems like low hanging fruit to invest in those already in the system rather than invest in getting more students into the system. So that's what we've been doing for now three years. We've invested a little over $7 million in roughly 6,600 students of whom um, the majority are women. Um, or students of color, and they're all six to 18 months from a job in tech, which, you know, uh, the outcomes of them taking a job in tech, they contribute to innovation, they drive the economy, they pay more in taxes, you know, it's a win-win for everybody. Love that. And yeah, my first question is, do these folks from lower income background usually have an interest for STEM or for tech sort of? Because it seems to me that this would be like the least of their concerns growing up like in tough environments. Um, yeah, science and technology I means you can get bullied for just wanting to get into these. Um, I would say in the U.S., there has been a 30-year effort to push more and more students into STEM. And the, the messaging that has been going out is that, you know, these are lucrative jobs. They are the quickest pathway. So you can spend 12 years going to school to become a doctor, and you'll be $200,000 in debt. Or you can spend two or four years to become um, a technician or an engineer, have less debt, and still earn that that professional level salary. And, you know, there's an estimated 1.2 million software engineer shortage in the United States. There's a 700,000 global shortage in cybersecurity talent. And um, now with the semiconductor industry investments happening, we're expecting 200,000 job openings a year in semiconductors, which includes like from technician level to PhD level. Um, so there's actually been a a dramatic increase of students coming into the pipeline. The challenge is the structural barriers for a student to actually finish their degree and graduate in our existing higher education system are keeping them from finishing. And it's often over something really trivial, like losing a few hours at work because you got sick and then not being able to pay your bills. And, you know, kind of a lot of students are walking a financial tightrope to get through school and don't have a safety net. So Last Mile Education Fund is that safety net. And you fund them, you provide them coaching. What exactly do you do in your program? Uh, we give them cash. Basically, rich students graduate, poor students don't. So we actually just give them money. Uh, we also 
provide what we're calling launch support services. So once we've stabilized them financially from whatever crisis that they're dealing with, we um, provide support for their resume, interview prep. Um, we even provide salary negotiation coaches. So when they're actually getting a job offer that they can negotiate and get the highest possible salary. And we're having students getting starting packages over $125,000 a year. So these are not deficient students. They are students who are struggling because of financial issues, but academically they're excellent. And what's the difference between the traditional diploma that they give vs the boot camps, you know, the private boot camps that they fund? Why not go that direction? Um, so we're focused in on a population of students that are already in the pipeline. So we're funding students who are juniors or seniors in college. We do actually fund some students who are doing the, the boot camp pathway. Um, and I think boot camps are an interesting and viable alternative pathway into tech. But the bottom line is tech is ruled by people who went to elite universities and got degrees in computer science and engineering. And so um, we still need women and people of color to get degrees in computer science and engineering and be at those levels. We don't want to create a secondary sort of blue collar class where all the women and minorities are coming in at a lower level that doesn't ever allow them to advance. So I think skilling is totally meaningful and boot camps can be really successful, especially for people who are like, maybe they got a degree in something else and now they want to add tech. But um, in mass, I don't think it's a viable alternative. And also like we're basically funding a untapped, un under recognized talent pool. Like it's so many students. I've calculated that if you just look at women who are in their last two years of a degree in computer science or engineering in the United States, that's 76,000 students who have a family income under $51,000 a year. So that's our target market. Um, and I've calculated if we fund roughly 23,000 students over the next decade, if even just a fraction of them graduate, that generates $2.15 billion of increased earnings. So like the ROI is really, really high. It is. Um, what do you have to say to teach entrepreneurship to these folks because you to me it seems that you're focusing on a low-hanging fruit and an opportunity that is doable and you can convince the government to to fund you for that and in turn you can fund these students that are already in the current educational system but would it it be better for real inclusion to have these folks start business and hire diverse people? What do you think uh, on that level? Um, I think that getting people into a position where they can be entrepreneur entrepreneurs, um, that is part of our, our, our pathway. If you look at the data, people who are entrepreneurs are people who have a safety net, who have the financial means to take the risk right? So if you're a first generation student who's getting a degree in say computer science, and you're going to be the first person in your family to earn over a hundred thousand dollars a year, can you really risk, you know, denying that hundred thousand plus job to do something riskier that might be entrepreneurial? So one of the ways for us to de-risk that is pay off student debt for these students, offer them entrepreneurship training, um, specifically offer them financial support while they are beginning their entrepreneurship journey. And those are all things that we're exploring. But, you know, financial security is the key common denominator among people who are entrepreneurs. Interesting. Um, I would say that the richest don't like have zero safety net or uh, yeah, they're, they love risk and they're crazies. Uh, they're pirates like myself. Um, but yeah, and interesting. You have the stats on that. So I'm, I'm going to look that up. Uh, definitely uh, got me curious there. Then what do you think about um, AI? And first, like, are you focusing on these types of jobs, I feel there's a huge demand for it nowadays. And second, do you think that AI can have a positive effect on uh, inclusion and diversity in this society? Um, 
So foundationally, we're funding any students that are in computing related degree programs. So, you know, anyone who's going to be working in AI is going to have some kind of foundational computing degree. And um, so, yes, we are we are supporting students that are going down that pathway. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about like, OK, is AI and low code, no code going to like diminish the demand for some of these jobs? But there's always going to be jobs in the like, it's it's just going to shift where the roles are. You're going to do maybe less, you know, direct writing of code and more managing of code that has been written by an AI. And so I think we're still going to need skilled talent for that. Um, in terms of how we're looking at using AI as an organization, we're scaling so fast. We're giving like 523 grants a month right now. And so for us to be able to, um, engage with and support and keep tabs on all of these students as they go through their the process of launching. We're looking at using um, text bots and chat bots and um, AI to you know check in on them, give them um, curated suggestions of action items, things that they need to do, um, helping with them, you know, say with resumes or interview prep and things like that. Um, as we are scaling as an organization, currently we're doing a lot of this with um, you know one-to-many texting, but to be able to actually create those sort of mass customization of check-ins and other um, customized support is gonna be really valuable. And that's kind of where we're headed next in our te technology development. Who do you see failing in the program? And is it something you can predict? I think the volatility of the hiring market in tech right now is threatening um, in that, um, you know, because of all the layoffs, the market has been flooded with experienced engineers, which has made new hire opportunities more scarce. Um, and it's also, you know, lots of companies have stopped hiring new, new roles. And so I think that that's definitely um, a threat, obviously, there's always waves, right? We're going to, the market's going to go up, the market's going to go down, there's going to be more demand, skills are going to change. Um, the other threat that's kind of happening right now is just the real, the changing dynamic landscape in terms of um, legislation related to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the United States, anti-DEI sentiment among um, some states that has sort of emboldened some corporations to be like, we don't have to care about that anymore. But it's when I think about, when you look at the data, the diversity argument isn't about necessarily doing the right thing. I mean, it is in my universe, but from a, from a mathematical perspective, white and Asian men are a declining resource because the pr predominant population of students that are coming out of the school systems now are not white and are predominantly coming from low in lower income families. And so, you know, for over six, over 60% of college students are women in the United States. So like, why would you only go after a minority population for your talent pool? We have um, far more people that could be at the table. The other thing is with um, things like national security, cybersecurity, um, anyone who has to be, you know, cleared to do work. Um, you need to hire domestic talent. And so that kind of throttles your opportunity in terms of hiring um, international students and H-1B graduates. And so, or not graduates, but H-1B sponsor visas. So I think there's a huge market for um, domestic talent now that um, there's such an increased focus on cybersecurity across the whole country. Yeah, in defense as well with the recent events in Ukraine and Israel that's going to skyrocket. It's it's interesting because a bunch of people say, oh, U.S. spends trillion on military. But when events like that happen, people are reminded why. Um, and yeah, that's going to create a huge um, flow of yeah demand for, for talent and uh, funding for these uh, companies. What are your top three objectives to finish off the year um so we um we just launched our technology platform so um you know figuring out the next steps of how we scale now that we have that in place um 
we continue to raise money. I've uh, brought in a little over, I think, $35 million so far for this project. Our goal is $60 million and um, probably going to move those goalposts at some point because of the demand is so high. And then, um, you know, we have tremendous demand for um, male students of color and we have a disproportionate of our amount of our dollars are available for women students. And so I'm actively trying to find the right uh, funding partner that wants to invest in men of color. And the argument that I like to make with, I mean, I think corporations should be paying for this um, because they're the beneficiaries of the talent and they're getting this talent in, in a very short period of time. And so just taking a portion of your um, recruiting dollars that are set aside for university new hires and putting them into this population, because what is going to make a student uh, more impressed, a water bottle or a hoodie that you gave them at a career fair or the fact that you paid their rent their senior year of college. And um, so that's one place that um, I would like to build like our sustainability model for funding. Um, government funding is actually quite sticky and challenging to do in the United States and very slow. And so we've launched with philanthropic and corporate capital primarily. Um, and I really see this as an investment fund. We are investing. It's just the ROI happens to be for society. And every student that we get over to the graduation threshold is going to earn on average $43,000 a year more than if they have some college and no degree. But the halo, the economic halo of what they provide to society is so huge. And our, you know, our 2.15 billion ROI is calculated in 10 years only. Doesn't even count the estimated, you know, 30 years that this person is going to work and their increased income over time. So um, there's a huge upside and the downside is, is unacceptable. I and there's nothing worse for all of us than someone who has the potential to fill one of these in-demand roles, but doesn't over something as nominal as, you know, the cost of a car repair. Right. And how can you get more funding, more proofs to the government that your program works? Like, how do you show them the impact so that you can get seven mil million more dollars? Yeah, so we um, um, are we're tracking our graduates. We get a LinkedIn profile on every single student. So we know where we can know where they end up working, the types of jobs they end up taking their estimated salaries. Um, so it's really just proof of concept of like of the students we invest in, how many of them do graduate and go into technology roles and, and what kind of impact is that having on the, on the workforce? Um, that's usually the validating measure that corporations are looking for. And um so far, you know, we're funding students so quickly, it's hard to keep tab on the numbers because students only graduate twice a year, but 1,700 out of roughly 5,000 students have already graduated. And so the thing we have to get really sharp on is like how many of those graduated because of our investment or how many of them graduated faster because of our investment and, and how much of their earnings can be credited to that investment. I think I the thing that's important to understand is the actual per student investment is incredibly small. Our average grant to, to a student is $956. So it's like shockingly cheap. And I've calculated that if you look at the full cost of getting a student from birth to their junior year of a degree in STEM in the United States, that's $477,000 of sunk costs. So like, why wouldn't we spend even, you know, five or 10,000 to get them to the degree and into the job versus letting them stop out at that point. And um, so we're leveraging massive investments that have been made by taxpayers and society, et cetera, with a small late stage investment that's getting like huge ROI. I love that. Um, Ruth, this company of yours, I mean, you've probably faced challenges uh, in the last couple of years. How have you resolved these? Um, so the challenge we face, believe it or not, is people don't believe we're real because we're so different than any scholarship or financial aid product 
that has ever existed. Most scholarships are about being exclusive and finding like, we're gonna find the best student. And so everyone applies and then you narrow it down to the best person. Whereas we look at every student individually, we assess, are you on track to get this degree? Do you have the potential to graduate? Great, here's the money. So they really don't believe us. And if you look us up on Google, one of the questions that pops up is, is Last Mile Education Fund legit? Like people literally don't think we're real especially the cybersecurity students. They're like, we don't trust the links. Don't send us links. And they like are very suspicious, which they should be because they're cyber students. But um, that's one of the challenges is, is having to educate students that, um, that this is a viable um, resource for them. And also having to educate the funding community to think different about potential. So um, I co-authored an article title in TechCrunch titled um, something like, hey, tech companies stop conflating privilege with potential. And unfortunately, in the corporate tech hiring process, there's a lot of focus on filtering for potential that is really filtering for affluence. Like the, the college you got into at 17 is much more a function of the zip code you were born into and how much your parents earned than any other factor. And um, the fact that you have won a bunch of hackathons is more a function of the fact that you don't have to work on the weekends and you can afford to participate in hackathons than it is necessarily proof of your innate ability. But we don't equally value the fact that someone, you know, worked in a retail job for eight years to put themselves through college because they really wanted that degree. So like there's value in someone who has persisted, struggled and kept going and we don't recognize that in the hiring process. So what I'm trying to argue for is um, to think more broadly and abundantly about who has potential to be successful because you know there's like 2,200 universities in the United States, but most corporations only recruit from say 30 of them. And mm. there's so much more talent to be had. Very impactful. Um... Yeah, I'm I'm behind the the cause here. It's I, I love how you rationalize it and you research your your stuff and you make it very obvious as per like why people should invest in you and and the impact of your cause. So yeah, I'm really impressed. Where can people find out more about you and the org, Ruth? Um, absolutely. So we are at lastmile-ed.org or at last mile fund virtually everywhere on the internet. And um, like I said, a small investment goes a very long way. Um, just $100,000 can generate something like $2.4 million of ROI. So like it's, it's, it's crazy how high impact that these investments can be. Love it. And I am Charles Cormier, host of CEO Wisdom Podcast.com. That was Ruth Farmer.